Well, good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to uh, this month's Emphasis Seminar. And it gives me uh, enormous um, pleasure to introduce this month uh, Carla Rita uh, Palmarino, um, who is Professor in the History of Philosophy at Radboud University in the Faculty of Philosophy, Theology and Religious Studies. Uh, her research uh, focuses on the history of early modern science and philosophy, especially uh, the metaphysical and epistemological foundations of natural philosophy, and on concepts of space, time, matter, and the status of mathematical entities. She's widely published, and I would strongly, warmly recommend uh, her, her publications to you, um, particular um, focus on um, Gassendi and Galileo, uh, really excellent articles. So if you don't already know them, I would very much recommend uh, that you read them. Um, today, uh, Carla Rita is going to address us on the topic of Borelli, versus Gassendi on the nature of moving forces. Palerita, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Stephen, for the invitation and this most kind introduction. Um, scholars have often drawn attention to the heterogeneous character of the so-called mechanical philosophy. Daniel Garber and Sophie Roux, among others, have argued that this umbrella term can designate four different enterprises Notably first, the general program of replacing the scholastic philosophy with a new philosophy. Uh, second, the uh, rejection of the Aristotelian ilomorphism in favor of a new ontology in which all phenomena are explained in terms of matter and motion. Third, the comparison of natural phenomena, most specifically the world and animals to existing or imaginary machines. And fourth, the application of the laws of mechanics to the study of natural phenomena. While the first enterprise represents the shared aims, aim of all the novatores, the other three describe approaches to nature that could, but did not necessarily go together. Borelli's De Moto Animalium, where the working of bones and muscles is explained in terms of simple machines, as you can see here, uh, is one of the most representative examples of mechanical philosophy in the third and fourth sense of the term. So comparison of natural phenomena with imaginary machines and the applications of, law, of the laws of mechanics to the study of natural phenomena. But can Borelli be said to have contributed to the second enterprise by endorsing a mechanistic ontology? Sophie Roux has addressed this question by introducing the distinction between the mechanical and machinal philosophy. And she has observed that Borelli's machinal explanations, so explanations by comparison with machines, are in fact grounded in mechanical explanation, in the sense that Borelli associates mechanics with material and uh, with everything which happens through corpuscular exchanges. And this is the reason why he excludes all processes which would happen without instruments by means of the direct action of any material faculty. So only material instruments are omitted by Borelli. Antonio Clericuzzi has also attributed to Borelli the principal conviction that all natural phenomena should be accounted for in terms of the shape, size, and motion of material corpuscles. However, the fact that on some occasions uh, Borelli referred to corpuscles of the four elements as well as of spirits, and that he regarded material corpuscles not as inert, but as endowed with an internal principle of motion, has led Clericuzio to designate Borelli's theory of matter as a moderate mechanism. Denis Deschen has spoken in somewhat similar terms of Borelli's non-restrictive mechanism, a definition based on a distinction between mechanism as an ontology of nature, according to which all natural things only have mechanical properties, versus a mechanism as a method of explanation. Deschamps writes, one could, and many philosophers did, adopt mechanism as a method of explanation without adopting the mechanist ontology. 
Borelli rejects the Cartesian reduction of animal souls to mechanical forces, and the principle of animal motion for him remains a non-mechanical soul. Uh, in this lecture, I will argue that Borelli's anti-reductionistic attitude is more encompassing than Deschamps and other scholars have so far assumed. This becomes especially clear if one compares Borelli's views on the ontological status of moving forces to those of contemporary mechanical philosophers, notably Pierre Gassendi, an author whom Borelli greatly admired, but for whom he parted company in the explanation of the nature and mode of action of gravity and magnetism. As I will show in the De Vi Percussionis uh, Liber and in the Motionibus Naturalibus a Gravitate Pendentibus, two books which are written in preparation for the Moto Animalium, Borelli's most important work, Borelli in these works explicitly rejects the assumption that all movements are the effect of an external force acting by contact and argues instead for the existence of intrinsic motic vir motic motive virtues which he traces back to the spontaneous motion of the spiritous material particles or of the small machines, machinule, composing physical bodies. At the same time, however, Borelli insists on the material character of these forces, for his spirits are material, and rejects explanations that invoke immaterial, attractive forces acting at a distance. Borelli's double polemical aims, on the one hand, he criticizes uh, mechanical philosophers who explain, for example, the fall of heavy bodies by means of forces acting from outside, and at the same time, his criticism of Aristotelian natural philosophy explains the presence of statements which seems to be in contradiction with one another. And this is something, to my knowledge, nobody had noticed about Borelli. So one finds in his works claims such as this one, that the movement of heavy bodies is intended to achieve a purpose, and this purpose is not movement but rest, which sounds like a fairly Aristotelian claim, of course. And at the same time, claims like this one, that natural operations are different from animal ones, they occur continuously and uninterruptedly as a result of a blind necessity and not actually when needed. Thus, compression and fall of heavy bodies always occur. So in this lecture, I'm trying to make sense of the apparent contradiction between these uh, two statements, and I'll do so by looking at Borelli's criticism of, uh, more specifically, Gassendi's explanation of the nature of moving forces, and on the other hand, his criticism of Aristotelian explanations of gravity. Um, and in the final part of the lecture, I will explore, if time permits, the connection between Borelli's analysis of moving forces and spontaneous motion of physical bodies and his account of some physiological processes in the, the Moto Animalium. And in the conclusion, I will finally return to the question whether or not Borelli can be said to have endorsed a mechanistic ontology. Borelli's correspondence with the librarian of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Antonio Magliabecchi, reveals that in the early 60s, Borelli uh, eagerly tried to co procure copies of Gassendi's opera Omnia for himself, Anome Mio, for his pupils, Scolari, for his friend, Un Amico, and even for an identified Sicilian knight, Un Cavaliere di Sicilia. Paolo Galluzzi, who has published the correspondence between Borelli and Magliabecchi, uh, noticed that Borelli displayed special interest for atomist authors such as Basson, Deusing, De Rodon, and Charlton, but above, above all for Gassendi, uh, who he seemed to regard as his tutelar deity in philosophy. If one looks at Borelli's works and correspondence, one finds in fact, several references to Gastendi's theories and observations, such as those on the motion, respiration, and nutrition of animals that are discussed in detail in the Demoto Animalium. 
sometimes Borelli corrects Gassendi's experimental results, but it is clear that he draws inspiration from Gassendi on a variety of subjects. Borelli is, however, most critical when it comes to one of the basic tenets of Gassendi's natural philosophy, namely his explanation of physical forces such as gravity and magnetism in terms of contact action. In the De Vipercussionibus, and also in this De Motionibus Naturalibus, Borelli offers a thorough criticism of Gassendi's views and proposes an alternative explanatory model which attributes a crucial role to goal-directed, self-moved spiritus particles. Borelli's aim in the De Vipercussionis is to accomplish the project left unfinished by Galileo by investigating the true and intimate nature of percussion and its various effects. Having dealt in the first two chapters, uh, the title of which you see here, um, with the nature of motion in general and with the causes and principles of movement, Borelli sets out to demonstrate in chapters three and four that projectiles are not kept in motion by the medium, as Aristotle thought, but are rather moved forward by a virtue impressed in them by the throwing subject. It is not difficult to discern in Borelli's approach and vocabulary the influence of Gassendi's De Motu Impresso a Motore Translato Epistole 2, a work published in 1642, the year of Galileo's death, that provides an empirical confirmation and theoretical justification of the Galilean laws of free fall and projectile motion, as well as of the principles of relativity and of the superposition of motions. And as Galut has observed, what um, Gassendi manages to accomplish in the De Motu Impresso Motore Translato is a kind of synthesis between Galileo's dialogue and Galileo's discourse and thereby realizing a synthesis between uh, Copernican's cosmology and the new theory of motion, a synthesis that Galileo had not been able to realize in such an explicit way, due, of course, to its, his condemnation by the church. Now, the first explicit reference to Gassendi is found already in chapter two, at the very beginning of the De Vipercussionis, uh, and here Borelli refers in seemingly positive terms to the most learned Gastendi, who remarked that we speak of moving, which is the action of the agent, and of being moved, which means being subjected to movement. No neutral world is, word is known for motion, which for the same operation would indicate the action as well as the fact of being subject to the action. Now, Borelli comments that this common language use, which distinguishes between that which moves and that which is moved, wrongly suggests that whatever is moved must be moved by an external force. This is, however, not the case in nature, where there are many examples of operations that are generated by themselves. Now, although here Gass uh, Borelli seems, in fact, to agree with Gassendi, if we look at the rest of the quote, we see, for example, in the last sentence that he concludes that it is false to say that everything which moves in nature is impelled by a distinct and separate motor. And this might be a first critical reference to Gassendi, as I will show that the criticism becomes much more explicit. But it is clear that Gassendi disagrees, uh, uh, Borelli disagrees with Gassendi. And here, for example, he writes that heavy bodies and animals seem to move by themselves, that is to say, by the intrinsic cause and principle. Although there are many who say that they are moved by an external cause, the shortcoming of their explanation is obvious. So what Borelli does in the rest of the uh, central chapters of the De Vipercussion is precisely to show that, in fact, motion of heavy bodies does not derive from an external principle, from an external cause, but rather from an intrinsic principle. Um, Borelli clearly perceives a tension between Gassendi's theory uh, of the motion of atoms and his account of motion of compound bodies. 
So Gassendi, it is clear, especially in the Syntagma Philosophical, he attributes to atoms an innate tendency to motion. However, when he talks about the compound bodies, the rest concrete, um, Gassendi underlines that compound bodies can only be moved by an external force. And Boris Riley seems to perceive their attention. So if atoms have a natural tendency to motion, why couldn't one attribute the same innate tendency to motion also to compound bodies? In this sense, it is clear that Borelli remains faithful to the Galilean uh, idea that gravity is something intrinsic in the body. This is a very famous quote from the dialogue in which Salviati, Galileo's spokesman, on the one hand stresses that he does not know what gravity is, so that he's ignorant about the essence of gravity, but at the same time he concludes that the force which takes this, a projectile um, on high, is no less internal than that which moves it down. So there is an internal force of gravity, which is responsible actually for the deceleration of projectiles thrown upward, as well as the, for the acceleration of bodies falling downward. Both Goyre and Bertoloni Meli has stressed, have stressed that Borelli remains faithful to this Galilean conception of gravity. Gravity, of which one ignore nature, like uh, Galileo claims in the passage we have just seen, is a natural tendency of bodies to join to their whole. Planets tend towards the sun, they are not attracted by the sun. And Bertoloni Meri also stresses in commenting about, you know, uh, Borelli's theory of planetary motion in the Theorica Mediceorum Planetarum, that Borelli conceives of the orbital motion of planets as the result of an imbalance between outward and inward tendency. This inward tendency is due to an appetite of the satellites or planets to move toward the central body. So both Correa and Bertoloni Meri stress the fact that gravity is in fact an internal tendency for Borelli. And in fact, if we look at the, um, the V percussionis, we see that the natural motive faculty of gravity is defined in similar terms as an intrinsic cause and principle that uh, Borelli stresses the purpose of um, the nature in the movement of heavy bodies. He speaks of an effort of gravity, which is aimed at the mobility of the heavy body at the center of the Earth and the natural tendency and instinct of heavy bodies. Uh, the insistence or the intentional character of natural motion reinforces the comparison, which one also, uh, which have already encountered here in the uh, opening pages of the De Vi Percussioni, between the motion of heavy bodies and that of animals. I've shown a quote in which is as heavy bodies like animals can have an intrinsic tendency to uh, motion. So both these motions derive from an internal cause. In the central chapters of the De Vi Percussionis, uh, Borelli tries to substantiate this claim by clarifying the nature and the mode of action of gravity. And given that he explicitly presents his theory as alternative to Gassendi's, it is worth summarizing briefly the account of gravity contained in the motto. And nobody has ever looked at these critical remarks of Borelli towards Gassendi. Um, so let's summarize briefly the theory of gravity in Gassendi's The Motto Impresso, a motore traslato. What you see here is a very interesting diagram found in the De Motu, uh, which offers a joint representation of the uh, parabolic trajectory of projectile and of the law of free fall, because the central line BA, you see BC, CD, D, here you see that the spaces traversed by falling bodies grow according to the odd numbers starting from one, which is, of course, Galileo's law. So here, the Gassendi offers a very interesting joint representation of the two Galilean uh, laws. And the parabolic trajectory is the trajectory of a ball thrown upwards on a moving ship. So here you have a joint representation of the two laws and, of course, of the principle of Galilean 
um, relativity. So Gassendi endorses Galileo's laws, but he does not agree with uh, Galileo's account of gravity in terms of an internal force. So there were Galileo claims that both projectile motion and gravity derive from an internal principle. Gassendi stresses that they both derive from an external force. This external force is the vis attains, the attractive force of the Earth. Um, and Gassendi says that so gravity uh, the bodies uh, fall under the effect of this attractive force of the Earth, and the Earth emits chains of magnetic particles that hook into the pores of the bodies and pull them towards the Earth. So here you see that he compares this magnetic rays with cords which grab the bodies with little hooks, these hamulis, little chains. So material things that really grab the bodies and bring them downwards. Um, in his attempt to explain the mode of action of the vis attrains, the destructive force, Gassendi, however, has to face two difficulties. The first one is related to the fact that according to Gassendi's own understanding of action through contact, this vis attrains should operate by means of equal and successive pushes. And Gassendi thinks in the demo to that if you have one force imparting this push, the successive equal pushes, that the body would accelerate, not according to Galileo's law of the odd numbers, but according to the law of natural numbers. So in the first time, we traverse one space, in the second interval of time, two, and then three. So in order to get to the Galilean law, Gassendi has to introduce a second force, which helps the vis attrains. And this force is the vis impellence. It's the impelling force of the Earth. So it's a kind of antiperistasis. So the air rushes upwards to fill the void left empty by the falling body and then pushes the body from behind. In the Epistole de Proporzione qua gravia decidencia accelerantur, written in 1646 in response to the criticism formulated by the Jesuit Pierre Lucas, Gassendi comes to the conclusion that the visa trines is by itself enough to produce the Galilean acceleration. So he drops this vis impellence. So in the re-elaboration, he says, I had made a mistake that the attractive force of the Earth is enough to produce an acceleration according to the um, odd numbers. A second difficulty Gassendi um, has to face is to account for the specific mode of action of the vista trines. He has to explain how is it possible for this chain to reach the body and bring it back uh, downwards. And in order to explain this mechanism, he resorts to ad hoc comparisons between the behavior of these magnetic chains and that of parts of living organisms. So in the first quote, he compares the motion of magnetic chains to those of our arm, which can bend then to the articulation. So uh, the chains reach out to the bodies, grab them, and then bring them backwards. And in the second quote, he compares this motion of the magnetic chains to the tongue of a chameleon. Now, Gassendi was, of course, criticized for making use of vitalistic analogy in order to explain the principles of his uh, me uh, mechanical philosophy. And a criticism was formulated by the Aristotelian Lagrange in the 17th century, who says it is not difficult to uh, criticize, to, to fight against Gassendi's opinion concerning heaviness, because the problem, Lagrange says, that it is not clear why these chains, after having reached the body, can invert their direction and come back. And Gad Freudenthal, in 1993, has argued in somewhat similar terms that the problem inherent to the very premises of the mechanical philosophy in the period before the introduction of in interparticular forces is this. How can particles issuing from a body conceivably bring about a motion towards the body? Why is there this back and forth? How is it possible that these chains invert their directions? 
Uh, if we go back to the uh, Devi uh, percussionist, we see that uh, Borelli uh, discusses and discards both um, uh, accounts of gravities in terms of the vis impellents and the vis trines provided by Gassendi in the De Motu. In Proposition 85, he argues against the vis impellents and he says that it is not the push of air compressing the falling bodies from behind that can cause free fall. And here he noticed something really obvious that if you know the cause uh, were the uh, impulsion of the of the air, then projectile thrown upwards would also have to accelerate due to the same mechanism. But it is especially the second hypothesis, Gassendi's explanation in terms of this attractions, which Borrelli criticized at length. So here, this is the criticism of the vis impellents in Proposition 85. I claim that the cause of acceleration is not the push of the air. Since the push of air is supposed to be the cause of the acceleration, the upward movement of heavy body should be accelerated, which is obviously not the case. But as said, it is especially this proposition which is interesting for us. Um, uh, in Proposition 86, Borelli discusses the hypothesis that gravity is an attraction exerted by a magnetic faculty of the Earth and explicitly takes issue with the famous and very learned Gassendi, who supposes it is an unquestionable axiom that the character of a natural movement is the evenness and the uniformity. Actually, since heavy bodies fall in an accelerated, accelerated movement, Gassendi does not hesitate to assert that they are violently impelled by an external motor. He says that this external principle impelling the heavy bodies downwards is magnetic effluxes which are diffused everywhere from the Earth. He actually worked hard to give a likely explanation of this operation. But if, for the truth's sake, I may express myself freely, this way of acting seems completely incomprehensible. So much for uh, Borelli's great admiration of Gastelli. Here it is clear that he's very critical of these explanations of mechanical philosophers. And why is Borelli so critical? Borelli finds a number of problems with Gassendi's causal explanation of gravity. Uh, what he uh, notices is um, if this magnetic rays were the cause of the free fall, this magnetic rays should either pull or push the falling body. Borelli says there is no other option. In order to push or pull the heavy body, they would have to move in the same direction, that is to say downwards. But then Borelli says such a retrograde movement to the Earth is completely opposite to the movement of diffusion of these effluxes, which occurs outwards. So this is exactly the same criticism we have encountered with Lagrange, which also um, Freudenthal formulates. So it's the retrograde movement is something that kind of cannot explain, if not by means of analogy with, for example, the tongue of a chameleon. But she doesn't tell us why these chains can invert their direction. There is a second criticism, uh, which is, in my view, extremely interesting, and which doesn't resemble any criticism I've encountered in other authors, um, which is um, even assuming that um, these uh, chains were able to invert their direction, the problem is, in order to produce this motion in the particles, they have to move themselves. And then he says, uh, either these chains move themselves already with accelerated motion, but in this case, we have to explain the accelerated motions of the chain themselves, and then this is only creates a regression, or these particles of the chain move themselves with uniform motion, and then it is not clear how something moving with uniform motion can produce an acceleration in the body. Okay? Uh, so he says, 
Consequently, it is not this external virtue of magnetic attraction which pushes a heavy body downwards. Moreover, uh, yes, uh, Borelli says that even admitting that the word is changed, pushing a body downwards, this action from the outside would not be able to produce an acceleration according to Galileo's law. What Borelli here claims is that with each successive push of the chains, the body would accelerate a bit less. So in the first moment, the push would add to the moving body a degree of speed equal to the um, line LG. In the second moment of time, GH, it would add to the moving body a degree of speed MO, which is smaller than LG. In the third moment of time, it would be a degree NP, which is smaller, up until the moment in which the motion would become uniform. And it is very interesting to compare this criticism with that formulated by Descartes in a letter to Mersen of March 1640, in which Descartes says, the subtle matter pushes in the first instant the descending body and gives it one degree of speed. Then in the second instant, it pushes it a little less and gives it almost 100 degree of speed, and so on in the other instance. This happened more or less in a duplicate ratio at the beginning of the fall, but this proportion gets entirely lost after the bodies have fallen several fathoms and the speed does not increase anymore or almost not at all. What Descartes says here could be really represented with the same diagram Borelli uses. The difference being that this is the reasoning Descartes uses to reject Galileo's law of fall and to say, you know, this is why it's simply an approximation. Borelli, by contrast, takes the validity of Galileo's law for granted. He also says it is empirically confirmed. And hence, the fact that the law is not um, reconcilable with such an explanation of fall is, in Borelli's view, a proof of the fact that this explanation cannot be correct. So how does Borelli explain uh, the motion of free fall? He says that if one admits that there is a principle acting from within, you do not have this problem of having to explain the successive contacts, but there is a continuous internal impulse. And if a body is moved forward by an impelling virtue carried with it, like a motor within a boat, and the impeller repeats successive blows equally strong, the resulting movement will be uniformly accelerated and will be in a ratio equal to the ratio of the squares of the times. So an internal only and force acting from within the body can produce, according to Borelli, um, an acceleration according to Galileo's law. So, so far, we have seen Borelli provide a mechanical explanation of the acceleration of fall and a teleological definition of gravity as a body's tendency to reach its due place at the center of the Earth. And in order to bridge the gap between these two levels of explanation, Borelli tries in Proposition 87 to fathom the true cause of acceleration. So it is clear, Borelli says, that the acceleration does not derive from the uh, action of the air, does not derive from a visa trans like the one Gassendiatz postulated. So what is exactly this? the nature of this internal force which pushes the body from within? According to Borelli, this force is, to, um, uh, is, equal, is, is the result of the spirits implanted in the material parts of the earth, like in a mold, move and agitate themselves and molded substance with enclosed force, then any heavy body would always carry with it the impelling cause. Since the moving cause is always tied to and carry with, carried with the heavy body, this avoids all problems. It is not absurd to admit in material particles what is considered in material spirits. Force and power thus might be supposed to exist in heavy bodies not for movement as such, but to attain the due position and equilibrium. 
As long as it has not attained its goal, the need of nature must always be satisfied. So here we have all the bits together. So there is still this theological language, there is a goal, and this goal is the goal of the spirits which are in the material parts of the earth, but these spirits, uh, Borelli clarifies, are themselves materials. Now, although Borelli does not say much about the nature of these spirits, uh, he seems to suggest in other parts of the, uh, his work that these spirits are not separate particles, but are rather tied together with the parts of heavy bodies. So he does consider the possibility that there are spirits in the pores, but he says, no, they're really tied in. They are really parts. Uh, they are embedded, as it were, in the heavy bodies. This, explain why, uh, this explains why the compressive action of the heavy body is, I quote, effective perpetually and can never be eliminated. Because if these particles could be added to the pores, they could also, of course, leave the body. So they are always embedded in the body, which explains why gravity is always present. Borelli returns to the issue in the Demotionibus Naturalibus, uh, a book the main scope of which is to analyze the natural motions of bodies in a fluid environment. Here, he repeatedly speaks of the natural instinct or desire by which heavy bodies tend towards the center of the earth. So again, this teleological language. And argues against the many physicians and philosophers who speak with arrogance of an attractive quality. And here, of course, again, he's thinking of the offend. In chapter six of the Demotionibus Naturalibus, um, Borelli claims that there is neither attraction nor attractive force in nature. But he argues also against the Aristotelians who argued that the attractive force is immaterial. Not nature shows that no motion or physical action can occur without contact. And since a body cannot be touched by something immaterial, attraction must occur by way of some immaterial instrument. Uh, so here it is clear then that he is, does not agree with Gassendi, but he does not agree with authors who postulate an immaterial, immaterial species. So uh, attraction is due to an internal principle, and this principle must act by contact because it is material and it is part of the body. So it acts by contact, but from within the body. Um, in order to clarify better his views concerning the nature of moving forces, uh, Gassen, uh, Borel inserts, and here we go back to the De Dipercussionis, a digression, so it is also called the, the, uh, concerning uh, of the, on the reason why a magnet attracts iron. And here, it is interesting because he takes his distance both from people who invoke some small chains of, or of barred and hooked atoms, but they cannot explain how and why the small chains retract and bring the cold atom with themselves towards the magnet. And this is again the ascendi, and again the same criticism, why these chains can go back. Other people whom Borelli also criticized Imagine some whirling or some curved way carried out by the mentioned magnetic diffusion to impel iron towards the magnet. And this is, of course, a reference to Descartes. And these are the famous representations of magnetic attraction uh, offered by, by Descartes. So both explanations in terms of particles of matter traveling from the magnet to the piece of iron are considered by Borelli unsatisfactory. Or not only unsatisfactory, but he labels these explanations as most absurd hypotheses, which are rejected as they deserve to be. So he couldn't be more explicit in his criticism of uh, this kind of uh, mechanical explanations of magnetic attraction. What is then the cause of magnetic attraction according to Borelli himself? Here, 
he speaks about the, the fact that in the pores of iron, there are countless livelier and spiritual magnetic particles that are contained. They are arranged in a most disturbed order and entangled with each other. They are confusedly mixed. It must then be imagined that when an iron draws closer to a magnet that is comprised inside the sphere of its activity, this action results from the emanation of the breath of the magnet. Then the magnetic particles contained in the pores of the iron are agitated and rotated by the magnet as if it were by a ferment. Emanation from a magnet also creates some ebullition inside the pores of iron. Consequently, these moving spiritual particles by repeated blows propel the walls of the magnet. This results in an internal propulsion of both bodies, not different from that which was explained above in falling heavy bodies. Now, here it is interesting to, uh, to see uh, that in this case, Borelli uses an explanation which he has rejected in the case of heavy bodies, namely this idea that in this case, the spiritual particles are contained within the pores. And, and this, uh, in, I think that uh, the reason for this hypothesis is because he has to explain the fact that in, in, in magnetic attraction is reciprocal. So both, the magnet and the iron are attracted towards uh, one another. Um, so it is, while gravity is a universal tendency of all physical bodies, magnetic attraction is a reciprocal force that enters into action when the magnet and the iron are sufficiently close together. This apparently justifies, in Borelli's view, the introduction of specific particles as well as the explanation of their action by analogy with processes such as ebullition and fermentation. So these are things that do not happen all the time. Gravity is always acting, bodies are always heavy, but only in particular circumstances, as it were, this magnetic power is being activated. So we see that he makes himself um, comparison with magnetic bodies, but at the same time, he introduces some differences in the explanation of the functioning of these spiritus particles, I think, to account between the difference between the two phenomena. Um, as Borelli make, makes clear in uh, uh, both his works, is that gravity and magnetism have an important property in common, namely the spontaneous character of the resulting motion, a spontaneity which stems from the self-moving power of the component material particles. Another type of spontaneous motion with which Borelli deals in the Demotionibus Naturalibus is the elasticity of air. Uh, of course, a phenomenon which uh, many mechanical philosophers dealt with, as you know. And here again, he rejects the fantastic and fanciful hypothesis of other mechanical philosophers, and he uh, concludes, he comes to the conclusion that air is made of flexible and resilient machines like springs. If indeed the particles of air were not machines, one could not understand why and how they recoil after compression. Consequently, a motive force ought to be assigned to them. So if one did not explain this elasticity in terms of machine, one should attribute to the material particles the, the power of perceiving and feeling by some intelligent acquaintance the detriment which would result in constriction. If they did not perceive a harm, what for would they stimulate themselves to action? However, Borelli says, we do not need to attribute to bodies such feelings because it's easier to assign to the particles of air a structure which forces them to unfold when they are constricted against their natural requirements. So he imagines that they are like springs which recoil after being compressed. And if one uses such analogy with such machines, and if one says that air consists of countless just, just opposed 
small machines one does not need to attribute special feeling to the material particle. So here the accent is more on the on the little machines and no no as that uh, feelings and animistic explanations are being introduced. Um, so I said both in the, the Vipersionis and in the, the Motionibus Naturalibus, Borelli talks about spontaneous motion while describing the motion of heavy bodies or of iron and the magnet. You see it here, um, moves spontaneously, and these are the, the, the first quote is talking about heavy bodies falling downwards. In the second quote is talking about the iron and the magnet that are moved towards each other spontaneously by natural force as heavy bodies are brought spontaneously to the earth. And then there is this last quote in which he said, in that indeed natural operations are different from animal ones, they occur continuously and uninterruptibly as a result of a blind necessity and not actually when needed. Thus, compression and fall of heavy bodies always occur. So the question here is, why does Borelli speak at the same time of spontaneity and blind necessity? What does he mean by this? Why can emotion be at the same time result from blind necessity and be spontaneous? And in order to find an answer to this question, the best thing to do is to look at to the, the motu animalium in which actually um, Borelli applies the label of spontaneous motion to the motion of the heart. And let's see what he says. He says by the heart muscle seems to be on its own, not subjected to the will. By some blind necessity, it carries out very energetic and momentary pulsations, alternating with pulses and stops, also temporarily. So, since the very beginning, this motion of the heart, heart takes place by natural or rather an instinctive and blind necessity. If we want to be led to the action of the heart by analogy with other actions of nature, as required by a correct philosophic method, we must refer to motive forces which by some natural and inborn energy and by some necessity act spontaneously and always repeatedly, such as fire, the fall of weights, the flow of water, these occur always and continuously by nature. So here we understand that spontaneously and necessarily go together. So it's something which derives from an internal principle, but which ha happens always at the same time. So the heart always beats, and bodies always fall unless they are stopped from some external principle, okay? So, of course, one can intervene and stop the heart from beating, just as one can stop the free fall of bodies. Okay, and here I come to my conclusions. Um, Having analyzed in some detail Borelli's causal account of the spontaneous motions produced by gravity, magnetism, and the elasticity of air, we can now return to the question addressed at the beginning of this lecture, namely, did Borelli endorse a mechanistic ontology? If we follow Westphal's definition according to which the matter of mechanical philosophers is, and I quote, qualitatively neutral stuff, of every active principle and of every vestige of perception, then Borelli obviously does not fall under this category. However, upon this definition, Descartes would probably be the only genuine mechanical philosopher, as most early modern atomists and corpuscularians, while rejecting hylomorphism, still attributed some form of activity to matter. What is interesting in my view about Borelli is that he reflected on the necessity of integrating active forces in his mechanical explanations. For him, it was obvious that inert and qualitatively neutral matter could not produce the great variety of physical phenomena that are observed in nature. 
that Gassendi and other mechanical philosophers had to resort to vitalistic analogies to describe the operation of forces such as gravity or magnetism revealed in Borelli's eyes the impossibility of explaining their effects in merely, in, merely in terms of action by contact. So the very fact that they resort to vitalistic analogies show the limits of their mechanistic explanation. Borelli's own solution consists in attributing to physical bodies an internal principle of motion, which he locates in the lively spiritual particles, which are material and hence ontologically different from, say, Moore's immaterial spirit of nature, or in the elastic structure of the little machines composing material bodies. In the De Vie Percussionis, Borelli describes the action of these forces in terms of desire, effort, and goal, expressions that seem to confirm Westphal's association of an active principle of matter with a vestige of perception. In the Demotionibus Naturalibus and in the Demoto Animalium, however, Borelli's language becomes less teleological as he starts to put the, accents, the accent on the necessary character of physical notions. He calls them spontaneous to stress the fact that they derive from an internal principle, but speaks at the same time of a blind necessity, precisely so as to, to rule out vestige of perception in the non-living realm. Thank you for your attention.